a very good morning dear students so once again welcome back to film studies after a short break um so in this particular session we'll be uh dealing with some of the other aspects uh that add meaning to a film we've already dealt with uh the first part that is mizonson i hope you remember uh, mizonson which is all about the setting costume lighting uh, the properties and the action the entire ambient the entire landscape within the frame all these elements together constitute mizonson i hope you remember mizonson so uh, other than mizonson these are the other factors that add meaning to cinema cinematography editing sound and color of which we have already uh, discussed editing how uh, editing which should be called as an art how it adds meaning to uh, a film and what are the technical aspects of editing uh, were also actually discussed in the last class now in today's session we'll be focusing on the other three elements uh, the other three factors that are cinematography sound and color so we are quite familiar with the term cinematography we quite often use the term cinematography or cinematographer so what is exactly cinematography we know that film making is an art which needs years of practice in order to cultivate a consistent craft and a keen eye for film making and this is what actually differentiates this is what separates great cinematography from cliche movie making because cinematography it is the art of photography art of camera work in film making it is defined by the film uh, people as the art and craft of making motion pictures by capturing a story visually though technically cinematography is the art and science of recording light either electronically onto an image sensor and chemically onto film so basically uh, technology is involved science is involved apart from that cinematography is the art of making motion pictures by capturing a story visually just keep all the technical uh, electronic parts of cinematography apart it is an art so the process of capturing moving images or moving pictures on camera so this uh, cinematography comes during the production phase of the film uh, where the design you know the style of a film are determined by the director cinematographer and the production designer so it is the creation of images uh, that you see on the screen a series of shots that form a unified narrative where each shot and or each frame uh, demands attention so while uh, capturing an image or a picture cinematographer considers a few factors like camera placement way to place the camera camera movement <coughs> sorry shot composition shot size focus and lighting and it is the director who usually makes uh, key decisions regarding the camera and the cinematographer actually makes it happen and cinematographer is uh, also known as the director of photography uh he is known as dp or dop and the choices of lenses camera and lighting are all part of a cinematographer so uh, uh the position uh, first if you look into the position part the position of the camera affects the way audience react to that particular shot it has strong emotional impact as well as it conveys the behavior of a particular character for example if a, a villainous character is shown uh, it would be good if a close up shot of him chewing something in his mouth is shown because that would give him uh, that villainous that ill mannered look 
camera movement it it can heighten the emotion and suspense in a scene uh the cinematographer he actually uh chooses to move the camera with the characters and then gain perspective there are different ways of doing that either the camera move with the character or the camera is kept static and when the camera is kept static we are actually separated from them then again uh, you know short composition is there which refers to the way elements of a scene are arranged in a camera frame and the short composition uh, refers to the arrangement of visual elements in order to convey an intended message and one visual element must be arranged uh, is that of the actors where to place the actors uh, which part of the frame uh, the actor should occupy then again short size matters how much of the shot is actually seen whether it is going to be a close up shot or an extreme close up shot then focus here the cinematographer's job is to play with focus to emphasize different aspects of the story how uh, intoxicated is the characters by going in and out of focus and that finally comes lighting lighting uh, separates uh, the person uh, sorry lighting is actually uh, done by uh, a separate person uh, usually you usually we call such a person as the light boy uh, so uh, he is a person with knowledge about uh, the lighting too and one tool that is helpful for the uh, cinematographers in doing their uh, camera work or in doing cinematography is the storyboard storyboard gives them an idea about the particular shot uh, how, where to place the camera what kind of a shot the size of the shot the length of the shot everything will be uh, very clear if they have the storyboard with them and there are many softwares nowadays uh, to keep uh, the storyboard in chronological order so cinematography is ultimately about capturing desired images and various techniques are being used for this so uh, if you look at this you know uh, there are different uh, scales of shots and this scale of shot is actually the widely accepted set of conventions which uh, describe or define framings of a film image image or distances between a camera and the subject these are all technical aspects um, uh, then comes the categories of shot uh shots are classified on the basis of distance height angle of the camera the level of the camera camera of movements focus and masking then uh again with regard to height height shows the degree of elevation to the camera the positioning of camera distance again uh based on distance we have close up extreme close up medium close up medium shot medium long shot long shot extreme long shot then uh, angle the straight on angle high angle low angle so these other frames also like uh, level in framing the camera of movement pan shots and tilt shots focus where we have deep focus shallow focus iris shot shot reverse shot framing and composition long take off 30 degree rule and 180 degree rule all these are important uh, shots uh, that a cinematographer must know so if you are a person uh, truly interested in film making uh, i request you to watch uh, the videos that are um, attached with this particular one which will give you a very clear idea about uh, the different types of uh, camera movements camera shots that are used in film by uh, cinematographers and i am not a person who has got such a you no know, thorough knowledge about the technical aspects of camera i request you to watch uh, those videos that are done by professionals so basically a cinematography as i said is the process of capturing moving images or pictures on camera and uh, the different elements that are considered by a cinematographer are the camera placement camera movement shot composition 
sorry shot composition the size of the shot focus and lighting and we have all these different types of shots according to the height distance scale angle uh, and yeah that's it now uh, moving on to the uh, second element that is sound sound uh, we know that uh, you know is one of the important aspects of film because uh, earlier uh, cinema was silent for many decades and if we talk about those pioneers who try to incorporate sound in cinema the first person was thomas alva edison i hope you remember edison and his contribution to cinema he first invented a phonograph we know that and he tried to incorporate this phonograph with uh, an instrument that was there during the earlier days at the very beginning of films that was zoo praxiscope i hope you remember zoo praxiscope again so later uh, edison tried to develop kinetophones kinetophones was again something that we discussed in the class where we were talking about the history of cinema kinetophones are those short videos that were shown through kinetoscope a device that was developed by edison so kinetophones uh, were actually a combination of kinetoscope and phonograph so short videos with little bit of uh, sound was uh, shown by edison edison through his kinetophones so cinema uh, as we know was silent for many decades and it was by 1900s that people started recording sound on disc and it was during the paris world fair of 1910 three devices that could record sound and visuals were exhibited and the three uh, devices that were exhibited in that paris world fair of 1910 were the phono um, cinema theater the panorama and the chronophone but these three devices they suffered from problems of amplification uh, sync problems and problems of recording time so by 1910 uh, films were not silent because uh, it was uh, decided by the big movie theaters to play live music with the help of orchestra so uh, people like uh, d w griffith they employed orchestra uh, along with uh, the movies but this could be done only by the big theaters uh, those small theaters in villages they suffered uh, from sync issues and also they couldn't afford the orchestra so the movie theaters they asked the studios to get some pre-recorded music so uh, in 1921 Uh, a person by name dr leed he developed uh, uh, a kind of film sorry a kind of a device known as phonofilm in 1921 and phonofilm uh, with the help of this uh, he produced more than 1000 pictures but uh, this particular device wasn't promoted uh, by those studios because uh, they thought uh, or it was in fact a fact Uh, that this would uh, make them invest more capital into cinema so later warner brothers uh, they were actually during those days a small studio but they accepted one of the sound system companies which were which was rejected by many other <coughs> big studios of the time so they accepted this sound system company and in 1926 they release the first film with music or with uh, with sound that is don juan don juan was released in 1926 and music recording was put in this particular film for the first time and uh, in don then later followed by don juan came uh, warner brothers the jazz singer released in the year 1927 it was directed by alan crosland so uh, it is said that with this particular uh, movie the jazz singer the silent era came to an end
spectators were attracted to come back to film theaters because of the sound aspect so uh, as i said uh, sound put an end to the silent era uh, and also to the slapstick comedy of uh, charlie chaplin at the same time it created new genres like musical and screwball comedy and uh, sound also affected the careers of many actors because those actors whose voice did not match their filmic image they had to leave and while the actors with theater experiences uh, they became stars on silver screen because of their voice and uh, it had its impact on narrative as well because sound ensured dialogue and then came a greater space for social and psychological reality and the uh, all these made the movement of the narrative faster so at first uh, a single microphone was the only means of recording sound uh, it uh, obstructed the movement of actors around the standardization of this equipment and the production uh, made film making a very costly affair so from 1930s to 1950s an optical single track sound recording was in use and uh, which eventually uh, gave way to stereophonic sound with the advent of uh, wide screen for exhibition later in 1970s the dolby sound system with a four track stereo system having features for elimination of background noise replaced the stereophonic system so just look how this uh, system developed from a single microphone to that of the dolby sound system in the 1970s dolby was actually a a, a company a sound company uh, they came up with a system of sound recording in the 1966 um, so this uh, later uh, after becoming successful in film industry they also uh, introduced dolby stereo for music so dolby actually used four channels to record sound and the four channels were put in film in two optical strips instead of one early only one optical strip was used and instead of that dolby used two optical strips and uh, then later uh, dolby sound they became digital uh, and the first uh, movie that got released with Do dolby digital was uh, batman returns in 1992 so uh, today this dolby uh, digital sound is being used world over and then later it was followed by the sony dynamic digital sound uh, then uh, now we have the dts the digital theater system and Uh, dts was something i remember employed with the movies like the jurassic park so uh, this is all about the the history of sound how sound came into cinema and this is a quote uh, regarding the sound in film as well as in television sound is the input we take most for granted when watching a flick we take the explosions kisses gunshots and thunderstorms as symbol recordings when there is a whole set of technicians and technologies put in play to give you a sense of what a jedi light saber sounds like in action so we never uh, usually acknowledge those little bit of uh, sounds that we listen when we watch a video or a film so too much of effort is uh, put in in order to make a single sound whether it be of an explosion or a kiss or a simple uh, small sound now uh these are the sounds that we usually see in a uh, film uh, the human voice the sound effects and music these three are the essential parts of the entire soundtrack of a film the human voice sound effects and music and each of these elements can be recorded during the shooting of a film or added afterwards and many movies are there that actually uh, shoot the sound while taking the shot itself now regarding the importance of sound why do we need sound in cinema these are the three different uses uh, or importance of sound one is to stimulate reality to add or create something that is not there 
to help the director create the mood if it is going to be heavy storm you know that is very clear in the sound that is given and uh, so we have seen the history of sound now um, let's have a discussion on the different types of sounds that are there in films there are basically uh, two main types of sounds in uh, cinema diegetic and non diegetic sound and uh, this particular word diegetic it actually comes from uh, the word diegesis which means world of the story so when constructing a film or tv drama we can play sounds inside or outside this world and that is the etymology of the word diegesis world of the story and you can have sound inside or outside this particular world so diegetic sound is also known as actual or synchronous sound uh, the other is non diegetic it is also known as extra diegetic or commentative or asynchronous sound and in addition to that we also have intra diegetic or internal sound and external sound now what are these sounds let's have a look into that diegetic sounds are sounds that the camera picks up while filming or in other words diegetic sounds are those sounds whose source is visible on screen for example the voice of the characters voice made by some objects music from instruments so any sound presented as originated from source within the film's world that is diegetic sound and diegetic sound can be on screen or off screen depending on whatever it shows whether it is within the frame or outside the frame so like footsteps traffic the ticking clock talking gunshots all these sounds which has got a source are known as diegetic sound none whereas non diegetic sounds are sounds that are not picked up by the camera when filming it has been created and added uh, in the post production for a specific part in the story or in simple terms those sounds uh, whose source are neither visible nor has been uh, implied in the film such sounds are called non diegetic they are also known as commentary or asynchronous uh, and this type of sounds include a uh, narrator's commentary uh, the sound effects mood music the film score the voice over all such uh, sounds come under non diegetic and uh, usually uh, this non diegetic sounds are there in horror films and comic films in horror films this kinds of you know film scores are or sound effects are given to create that ambiguity Uh, in uh, comic films also to create the surprise element uh, non diegetic sounds are used so remember this the difference between diegetic sounds and non diegetic sounds diegetic sounds are those sounds whose source is visible on screen whereas for non diegetic sounds the source is neither visible nor has been implied i hope it's clear now other than this we have uh, external diegetic sounds and internal diegetic sounds external diegetic sounds are sounds which come from out of frame but it is understood that it belongs within the world of the frame we may not see uh, this particular uh, source of the sound but we are quite sure it has come from the screen that is external diegetic sound now internal diegetic sound any sound that happen inside the mind of characters that is internal diegetic sound there is also um, another addition to that that is intra diegetic for this internal diegetic sound all the thoughts the memories uh, the hearing impairments hearing losses all these are examples of internal diegetic sounds the thoughts that are happening inside the characters mind whereas in 
intra digestic sound uh, we do not know the source but the presence we know to exist within the narrative frame for example the voice over of a narrator whose life is told and later appears the uh, the inner thoughts of narrator uh, for example the inner thoughts connected with flashbacks so that is intra digestic sound and a uh, uh, best example for this you know intra digestic sound is uh, alfred hitchcock's uh, film rebecca uh, which uses the intra digestic sound other than uh, digestic non digestic external internal digestic sounds we have uh, these sounds also parallel sound contrapuntal sound silence and sting parallel sound uh, uh, is when sounds and music complement the visuals they are referred as parallel sound and more sounds uh, are actually parallel and it reinforces the visual information that is almost uh, uh, you know same in all the movies the sound and the music they complement the visuals then contrapuntal sound when the image and the sound do not match and this is very less in films because um, it is not to that much used by film makers still uh, it is used to create uh, a strong reaction from the audience used to create tension or uneasiness or comedy this kind of a <coughs> uh, you know mismatch between sound and image then comes silence silence is used as one of the most powerful uh, you know tool in film uh, stripping away sounds or muting sounds has a big impact on a particular shot because silence can create awkwardness discomfort um, it sometimes plays ourselves in the head of the characters or ourselves in the experience of the characters it uh, raises tension also builds up expectations so we know what happens uh, when the entire movie is silent for a minute while we are watching it what is the kind of emotion that is being created in our minds it is of course uh, some sort of tension discomfort or uh, you know building up uh, expectations in our mind so silence is very very powerful then comes sting a uh, sting is a short blast of sound to create emphasis or shock uh, a sting can be seen as a kind of exclamation mark that we use it is very common in uh, horror films uh, it is used to create false scares and shocks for example uh, a, a cat jumps out of a cupboard or someone uh, places a hand on the shoulder so the kind of sound that short blast of sound that is produced in order to create emphasis or shock and um, sting is also commonly used in tv drama to help emphasize the seriousness of a moment or statement that big bang sound not that big bang but short blast sound that is sting so i hope uh, now you know the uh, different types of sounds that are used in cinema the diegetic non diegetic external internal parallel contrapuntal silence and sting and there is sometimes overlapping between uh, the diegetic non diegetic external and internal now going back the different types of sound in tv and film these are the different types like dialogue the ambient or the natural sound additional dialogue recording narration sound effects score and sound track Uh, we know narration the voice of a person heard speaking but not seen on camera and usually the narrator is telling the story ambient or the natural sound that is a background noise in a scenes and um, it is like a the tone of a room then there is this background uh, for example if you look at this particular picture that is a from the movie the wolf of wall street so uh, the background noise is this ambient or natural sound then we have additional uh, dialogue recording or adr uh, something that is recorded after the uh, shooting 
and this is done if something ruined the dialogue during the shooting such as the noise of a plane or something then dialogue of course uh, people talking to each other score score is the original music that is created for the film and plays at different points throughout the movie if you now uh, soundtrack um, music included in film that wasn't created specifically for a film for example a song by a popular artist that is soundtrack uh, it needn't be uh, something not created specifically for the film because in uh, most of our movies that is specifically meant for the film itself um then sound effects any sound that are created for the movie such as footsteps alien sounds wind storm all these are sound effects so we have narration the natural sounds additional recordings dialogues scores soundtracks and the sound effects and there is also something called foley process i'll attach a video of this foley process uh, along with this video kindly watch it it is very very interesting how these people how the uh, foley artists they make sounds of you know different creatures different actions uh, even the minute sounds of someone placing their foot on snow how they make these sounds in their foley uh, stage foley stage is the place where these kinds of uh, recording uh, takes place so how do they do that the entire process is called foley process and we have foley artists and foley stage watch the video to know more about it it's very interesting uh so that's uh, all these uh, things are assembled together uh, in a movie and finally we have uh, something to watch something that is not silent but full of sound and music that's all about uh, sound now moving on to the last part of it that is color in film and regarding color uh, you know this particular quote by maxim gorky is quite significant everything there is dipped in monotonous gray uh, he uh, you know this particular a uh, statement by goki uh, it shows that the sheer grayness of the first film by lumia brothers uh, and he was quite startled by uh, this particular grayness that he saw in all these movies during the earlier period so uh, black and white photography had been an element of everyday life for over a generation but as soon as monochrome images began to move the black and white became ashen so color in film that shows a transition color is uh, as an important part of the filmmaker's toolkit uh, a filmmaker uses color uh, to create mood to create emotion to tell the audience when the scene is set and to provide more information about characters settings story and uh, you know color has got different meanings depending on the context uh, for example in one particular context uh, red uh, will be like very uh, red shows love or red could be very violent aggressive uh, blue uh, is usually seen as a you know color of warm uh, sometimes blue is used to show winter Uh, blues used to show night so it actually varies the meaning of color varies depending on the context so uh, though movement brought still images to life uh, it was a deathly life without its essential color so uh, as i said color sets the tone and mood of a film and before any of the actors have even uttered a word the entire context would be clear to us i mean what is going to happen would be uh, quite uh, you know clear to us because of the color that is being used so color manipulates the audience's emotions at conscious and unconscious levels color is that important and there are many many research articles uh, regarding the psychology of the use of color in films those who are interested can go through such articles which deal with the psychological impact of color that is used in film uh so color intensity uh, is also very very important um there are you know um 
strong saturated colors that are used uh, for example uh, if you just look at these uh, films uh, sorry uh, yeah look at this so these uh, films uh, Haiti or Sound of Music or the Avengers series or all the cartoon kind of movies have got strong saturated colors and these strong saturated colors are usually shown to uh, you know uh, used to give an idea of a hyper real cartoonish kind of a world whereas uh, you know monochrome images uh, are used uh, brown or the sepia uh, and these brown sepia colors are usually used to give an idea about uh, old photographs or uh, if it is a flashback and uh, again black and whites are also used to show a scene in past or uh, a scene that is in a character's imagination or memory um, this is uh, a, a very beautiful movie directed by Veru Munaripu those who haven't watched I request you to watch that a beautiful movie with too much of symbolic significance so look at the the lighting I mean the color that is used in the poster itself again uh, another movie uh, directed by Jairaj which got released in 2018 how this uh, monochrome uh, that is the use of only one color that is monochrome only one color is used throughout uh, you know the movie Bhayanagam so that again gives us an idea I mean uh, presents to us a world that is uh, you know in the past again if we look at these uh, two movies black is uh, one directed by Sanjay Lila Bansali almost all the movies of Sanjay Lila Bansali has got uh, you know the predominance of one or two colors in black movie it is uh, a combination of blue and black I, I felt so again there is another movie released one or two months back that is Pumba Pumba is a movie uh, you know very uh, creepy kind of a movie uh, scary at times uh, something too unreal but uh, Again, uh, sometimes we feel that this could happen some t you know, somewhere. Such a movie is Thumbad. And in Thumbad, uh, it is a combination of this golden uh, red-black combination uh, which gives us, uh, you know, uh, a very scary picture uh, about a world of, you know, uh, magicians uh, where all uh, unnatural things uh, are happening. Uh, so... Uh, look at the colors that are being used by these writers my focus is on color and not uh, the story of the movies on one hand we have blue on the other hand we have red black compo here it is a kind of a sepia brown color kind of yellowish a very saturated colors. and again it is said that these saturated uh, strong colors uh, when it when it presents a very fantastical hyper real world those weak colors that uh, you know uh, these colors show a kind of uh, uh, poverty or depression that is something that said by uh, those filmmakers regarding the use of strong colors and weak colors again uh, if you if you look at these uh, movies that deal with war almost all the movies uh, irrespective of nations the movies about war or war movies have this sort of a coloring altogether uh, regarding the horror films uh, this first one is that of a, a post-apocalyptic movie uh, this is uh, Mahesh and Pradikaram a very realistic picture this is again another realistic picture so how these realistic uh, films use color and then this is a, a rot movie rot movies again some are very noirish kind of rot movies such noirish movies have got a very dark coloring but other rot movies like i hope you remember that movie again has got a very uh, very bright you know appearance that's all because of the use of not just color but light and many other aspects are there but color is also important because without color the life that is presented uh, even though the pictures are moving seems quite deadly as dead and uh, 
yeah now little bit about the history of uh, color in cinema so regarding the history of uh, color in cinema uh, you know uh, right from the very beginning uh, cinema tried to incorporate color into it but it had to wait for several decades uh, for that uh, dream to come true so the advent of color television in 1960s in the us uh, made a turning point in the history of the production of full length color films so earlier we had uh, black and white uh, films uh, which made use of black and white cinematography and most black and white films uh, range across a spectrum from white through various shades of gray to black that was a uh, use of uh, black and white in earlier films black white and uh, various shades of gray so the term is sometimes used wrongly to describe films that were shot in just one color and uh, since the widespread move to use color from the mid 1950s the decision to use black and white in later cinema is chiefly an aesthetic one so we know there are many movies that are released even in the current year with black and white scenes so why do they incorporate black and white scenes it is the decision uh, uh, by the filmmaker to use black and white in order to evoke a particular historical period or in order to give a, a more kind of seriousness to the tone um, the earlier process in films began with hand painting of frames hand painting uh, of frames was done by women during those days uh, especially during the 1896 uh, during 1896 when uh, the american edison company they employed teams of women to hand paint images in the whole part of the frame and in france also george millis he did the same all by himself later some filmmakers they went in for tinting or dyeing the film but both these processes were time consuming and expensive <coughs> so the french film company um Pate Fres they developed a stenciling process that made tinting and dyeing quite easier and in britain uh, there was this kinema color and in france there was dufia color uh, these two companies they developed additive color process uh, they used color filters during filming and projection but these methods were not widely accepted so even during the um, early uh, sorry later 19th century there were filmmakers who tried to incorporate color into cinema uh, it started with edison who employed women to hand paint frames same thing was done in france and britain by filmmakers but uh, it wasn't successful then later came a company by name technicolor so the first experimenter experimentation with color films came in 1912 with uh, technicolor in uk so uh, the attempt was not very successful so a parallel approach was used uh, they uh, utilized subtractive color process and this subtractive color process is considered as the foundation of modern color cinematography and a subtractive color is actually what remains <coughs> is what remains when one of the primary colors is removed from white light leaving behind uh, other colors like magenta yellow and such colors so that is the subtractive color process considered as the foundation of modern color cinematography and subtractive color is what actually remains one of the primary colors is removed so uh, these uh, subtractive processes create color through a chemical process using two strip cameras and negatives along with a three strip system and these strips can produce a positive that can display a wide range of colors and this was successfully used in the 1920s by technicolor motion picture corporation which by 1932 stated uh, started using the three strip system and by 1935 color films were produced and they were a combination of black and white with color sequence in them so the first uh, successful uh, color production company was technicolor productions
so uh, by 1935 technicolor had complete control over color productions and in relation to hollywood by hiring out its cameras technicians and by processing and printing the films and during this period most of the color films produced were a combination of black and white color sequence in them and the early uh, color feature film was becky sharp directed by uh, robin manolian Uh, which got released in 1935 it is considered as the earliest color feature film and uh, later walt disney had produced a number of color animations by then uh, and then though though technicolor was expensive and it involved in many uh, obligations hollywood remained committed to it uh, especially with the box office hits gone with the wind and wizard of oz both these released in 1930 nine later the us government passed an anti trust law in 1947 uh, which trigger the process of erosion of technicolor's monopoly in 35 mm film though they continued with the production of epic films in 1950s so uh, the entire film industry is actually uh, indebted to technicolor this particular company who successfully incorporated color into films and the film that they first produced was becky shop in 1935 which was followed by gone with the wind and the wizard of oz so technicolor was the only company then and it had monopoly over the entire uh, incorporation of color into film but later in 1947 uh, us uh, law uh, was passed by the government which completely took the monopoly that they had though they produced uh, a number of films by then so after technicolor comes uh, the eastman color uh, that was in 1950s the eastman kodak offered the eastman color as an alternative to technicolor so uh, they already had a cross licensing agreement with uh, technicolor for the 16 mm films and eastman kodak went on to develop its own technology to produce uh, a tripack color film that could be used in any camera and that was cheaper and easier to use than the technicolor as it used a single negative and later the technicolor uh, they had compatibility problems with cinemascope format which led to its loss of power in the field and um, its affordability enabled eastman kodak to gain most of the film maker uh, by the end of 1950s and effected a steady transition from black and white to color feature films which dominated the production so the entire production of uh color making films uh was done by eastman kodak later by the 1950s later um you know in europe the black and white continued to be the norm till ni- late 1950s and the color films in the continent made use of technicolor mostly with the exception of germany which used uh, aqua color and again black and white continued to be the norm in soviet union and east europe uh, in soviet union uh, and east europe uh, you know the people uh, especially the soviet union people they saw a color technical as a symbol of capitalism so they uh, were reluctant to use color at first but later all these countries uh, by you know we you know they all started using color in their films Uh, by 2000 uh, came digital coloring which also had a significant I- impact upon film industry and uh, in japan uh, in 1934 they started producing color films with the setting up of fuji films uh, uh, or fuji color which by 1970s became an international competitor with kodak with its presence of a vast network in us and europe so these are the two uh, these were the two major film producing companies during the earlier days uh, kodak and fuji color kodak is that of eastman kodak in us and fuji color or fuji film in japan so this is all about the history of color films yeah so um, we have seen that um, the 1935 film becky sharp uh, which was based on um, William Thackeray's novel Vanity Fair is generally regarded as the first color movie uh, meaning the first to use the technology of 
the three color technique color it was directed by robin mamolian and it was visually an arresting movie but a week on the story part and it is uh, chiefly remembered uh, for being uh, the first true color movie so regarding uh, the first color movies in india uh, the first indigenously made color film in india uh, is kisan kanya kisan kanya uh, was released in the year 1937 it was directed by moti b gidwani and produced by uh, ardeshi irani so this is considered as a first uh, color film in india and it is chiefly remembered by public as the first indigenously made color film in india that is kisan kanya and regarding the first uh, color film in malayalam it is kandam becha kote which was released in 1961 um, uh, directed by t r sundaran uh and uh, the actors were tikurushi and uh, uh, arun mulla ponnamma so uh, this is not just the first color film in malayalam it is also the first east man color film in malayalam so these are the three uh, movies uh, which made the first step one in uh, world one in uh, india and the other one in our state beki shop kisan kanya and kandam becha coat so that's all dears about today's class um hope you uh, had a great session um so try to remember uh, the elements the different elements that um, you know add meaning to cinema the entire is on sun cinematography sound editing and color so that's all thank you